This is the family crest of Guayanas, which is Ku, the sea otter, and Gudingai, the red sea urchin, its prey. So the sea otter, even though it's not particularly common right now in Haida Gwaii, has a very distinguished role in our history and is very much in our consciousness now. You may be probably most of you are aware that sea otters were brought back to British Columbia in uh, the late 60s, early 70s, and 89 individuals, Alaskan stock from uh, the Aleutians and from Prince William Sound, uh, through an arrangement with um, the, the Americans, uh, DFO reestablished the population of sea otters in Chaklisset Bay, which is just south of Brooks Peninsula on the northwest coast of Vancouver Island. So the most recent count for sea otters is now at 4,200. And um, so they expanded very rapidly, reoccupying habitat that uh, has not experienced sea otters for a long, long time. So the feeding has been very good for them, and their populations have uh, expanded enormously. Right now, they occupy about one third of their, ter of their traditional biological territory, shall we call it, in British Columbia. And the species at risk goal would, that would be that they occupy all of it, and uh, they will. Um, on Haida Gwaii, uh, it was thought that they were extirpated from the islands by the early 20th century. Um, we've had 16 sightings, and I think Confirmed sightings, but I think a lot more, in fact. But 16 confirmed since 1972. So what I'm saying is that in Gua Haida Gwaii, around Haida Gwaii, there's not a breeding population, but, ra but rather there are wandering males. The males are the ones that wander around. And um, I should tell you a little bit about sea otters, a little bit about their life history. Um, I have my, my little friend here. So. It's a beanie baby. It's, cl it's collectible, okay. Uh, it has a name, a birth date, and there's a little poem about it, which I'll read you. But I have a serious intent on, on this, in fact. My sons gave this to me, but you'll notice that it's grasping something green. And that, warning bells. So the name of the sea otter is seaweed, and it was Born in March 19, 1996, and the poem reads, Seaweed is what she likes to eat. It's supposed to be a delicious treat. Have you tried a treat from the water? If you haven't, maybe you otter. <laughs> so this is pure ignorance <laughs> because, of course, sea otters are carnivores. But the Thai Corporation got it all wrong. My lesson, and is a serious lesson to you, is that our greatest threat in our relationship with the ocean is human ignorance. Now, it's pure corporate ignorance that no one figured out at HQ that sea otters are, are not herbivores. But this is very typical of a broad societal problem, is that most citizens find the ocean really a mystery, and we have a large popula proportion of the Canadian population for whom, particularly in the interior of our nation, for whom the ocean is, a, is an unknowable mystery. And this is actually a serious problem for us because we are very, very slow to, to evolve towards marine conservation in this nation. I'll give you some stats, some really simple ones. Canada's first national park, 1885. Canada's first national marine park, 1987. That's a century of Canadian history had to pass before we got around to start thinking about protecting the ocean. And we are deep behind the eight ball on this. Terrestrial conservation is inculcated deeply in our culture. We're used to it. We expect it. We have a long tradition of national parks. We have a very brief tradition of federally marine protected areas. Our agency, Parks Canada Agency, did not get its maritime mandate till 2002. And remember, we've been in terrestrial conservation since the 1880s. 
So that's just an indication to you how slow we've been to come to realize that we need to also think about conserving our maritime heritage besides our terrestrial land heritage. So what are sea otters? So we, people are very interested in them. They're gosh darn cute, but of course they're giant weasels. They're the world's largest weasel. They weigh about 45 kilograms. That's a big weasel. The, <laughs> now there's another otter in BC waters. That's the river otter, the northern river otter. And people are confused between the two, so let's dispel that. Northern river otters, there's a large coastal population of them, but they also occur right in throughout Canada's interior. So they're freshwater, but they're also maritime. They're about one third the size. They're very, very different than sea otters. So uh, the main groups of invertebrates that they eat, sea urchins, as in Kudingai, they eat uh, mollusks, such as abalone and uh, uh, clams and mussels, and they also eat crustaceans, such as crabs. So they eat enormously. Um, they are like, it's, just, it's as if they have a nuclear power plant inside. They eat about a third, between a quarter and a third of their body weight a day. And they, they need to eat all this food to generate metabolic heat because, maybe you'll stroke that beautiful fur pelt, they stay warm by uh, constant grooming and they develop uh, in their beautiful fine fur uh, air bubbles. But unlike seals and whales and things, they do not have a rind of blubber underneath their skin. This gives them this incredible appetite is what really gives them their ecological importance because they are considered a keystone species. Ecologists call keystone species species that are important way out of proportion to their numbers or their biomass. So for sea otters, the reason why they're keystone species is because they're eating all these invertebrates Particularly important is the sea urchin, and the reason why that's important is the sea urchin is a grazer of kelp forests. It's a herbivore, and they love sea urchins and eat them in large quantities. And because they eat urchins in large quantities, that means that that has an influence on local kelp forests, because as they grind down through the sea urchins, that enables more kelp to grow. And in fact, where sea otters occur, there's more dense kelp forest. And this itself provides a biological subsidy in, in the nearshore ecosystem because kelp forests are enormously productive plant systems that generate huge quantities of organic material that goes right into nearshore food webs feeding little fish and, and invertebrates and things like that. So the, kelp, it has, the sea otter has an enormous influence on, on kelp forests. However, they also have influence on other ecosystems. They will also feed in uh, sandy areas. They'll dig clams. Almost nothing is safe from a sea otter. They'll eat almost anything. They'll trap, if they can grab a seabird, they will. If they can get a fish, they will. But they're not very good at, the, you know their paws are very, very blunt. They're not particularly good at, at grabbing rapidly moving creatures, but they can certainly rip uh, mussels off the sea bottom. And as you know, sometimes you may have seen them in natural history shows, they'll have a stone that they'll put on their chest and they'll break their shelled prey against the stone and eat that. So um, another thing about sea otters is that uh, they are a species of, in fact, they have a very distinguished record in marine conservation. They've actually been protected since 1911. And uh, that agreement, which was the world's first multilateral marine conservation agreement, was the First Seal Treaty. and was signed by Japan, Russia, America, and Great Britain for Canada in 1911, and it was to protect uh, fur seals, which were being slaughtered in enormous numbers, but it had a rider for the protection of sea otters because there was sufficient consciousness even back then that there had been extreme over hunting of these species.